you, you can bring clarity to the most complex of things. We remember this in your, your, when you, your sort of breakout period when uh, the financial crisis happened, is that you can take incredibly complex stuff and make it apparently sound reasonably simple. What the hell is going on can you explain with Brexit, Brexit right now? And how do you actually... <laughs> how do you think it's going to unravel in the next two months? Seriously. Oh, it's a, it, I mean, Piers, that is the question of the moment. And actually, one of the things I always say to people is that this is both the best time and the worst time to be doing my kind of job. It's the best time because, my goodness, the stakes are so high. Every day brings a new shock. I mean, we've got next this morning, the, the retailer saying it's very worried that it's not going to be able to get its stuff through uh, the ports of Britain if there's a no-deal Brexit. So, you know, huge, big issues... But the problem is, there is tremendous uncertainty. Uh, and actually, we have uncertainty about the big things that affect this country greater than at any time, I think, in our lives. Now, my own view would be that there is a big chance, but I'm not going to say that it's an overwhelming probability, but there is a big chance that Parliament votes down pretty much whatever mm -hmm. deal the Prime Minister puts to... MPs. Probably we hope that he's going to have a deal, if there's any kind of a deal in the sort of November-ish time. If it's voted down, um, then we are into huge, again, levels of complexity and uncertainty. I do think, as she said this on, on, on the News at 10 last night, that the prospect of a yet another blooming referendum is now quite high, probably better than 50-50. Yeah. Now, that's... That seems to be the big issue at the moment, something that Labour are grappling with and didn't yesterday morning at this time seem to have a coherent message about. Mm. If there is a second referendum, Robert, who would call mm. it? How long would it take? What would be on the ballot Not. paper? And <laughs> you're, asking would... all the e you're asking all the easy questions. And what <laughs> would happen, crucially, and I think this is really interesting because you've got quite an a apocalyptic view of what might happen if... Remain was on the ballot paper and the Remainers won the second referendum. OK, I'm going to take that last point first because it's important to clarify what I'm saying about this. The thing that worries me most at the moment is how much hatred there is in this country, uh, how much mistrust of the way politicians run things. Um, and um, so, look, my bird song alarm has just gone off, if anybody's interested why they could hear the tweeting of birds just then. Um, <laughs> now... Someone calling you. <laughs> um, now, uh, the, 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 the thing that therefore does genuinely um, keep me awake at night is the notion that we have another referendum and we don't get a decisive answer. So if the result was... 51 to 49 mm. remain. I do think a lot of people who voted for Leave would feel that yet again they would say the establishment has tricked them, mm -hmm. uh, that the political system had let them down. And I think we would see the rise of more hate politics. I think politicians, you know, not unlike somebody like Putin, would begin to get the kind of support in this country which would then, I think, undermine our way of life. Mm. Equally, you know, if it was sort of 51 to 49 the other way, I don't think it solves anything. So my view about a referendum is there are big risks to the stability of this country if there is another referendum. And, you know, it's worth doing if there's a decisive answer, say 60, 40 in either direction. But as I say, I, what I really worry about is that we'd get such a narrow result that nothing would yeah. be settled and the uncertainties and turmoil would go on. Robert, let's turn to you, because very few journalists get the front cover of the Sunday Times magazine looking moody and sort of Johnny Depp-like, if you don't mind me saying, uh, on Sunday. I think, it's happened, I, think it's, I, think, I, think, I think it's happened to you, Piers, and you, you always look moodier than me. <laughs> well, what I was struck by was that you seem to be suggesting in the interview, a very good interview with Decker Aikenhead, that your, your life is sort of uh, constantly in peril from predatory women who are making a beeline for you at all hours of day and night. Would you like to discuss your, your terrible dilemma and yeah. to tell me how I can get a bit of the action? Yeah. So, look, you know, you, uh, Piers, you know Decker and you know that she is a very searching and good journalist. This is not stuff I should be clear that I had sort of expecting to be, uh, to be talking about. But she, did, but she asked me a couple of questions, one about 
you know, whether when I became a bit more prominent on TV, the way that women related to me changed. And she also asked me about whether when I became a widower, when my wife died, whether the way that women related to me changed. And actually, th there were quite significant uh, things that, that, that happened. Um, you know, I'm not remotely saying, as you say, as you sort of hinted in your rather amusing introduction, that my life has been made terrible by more interest from <laughs> women. In fact, it's brought me into this rather wonderful relationship I have with the journalist Charlotte Edwards right now. But, pe but people started to do some very odd things. You know, I get sort of letters and postcards through my letterbox saying, you know, from complete strangers saying, come out for a date. People would leave rather weird presents at reception when I was at the BB. See, and, and actually on the margin, there were some people who sort of, I mean, some of that, quite a lot of that sort of stuff is sort, it, sort of funny and quite nice, but then there, there was some behavior that just went over a sort of line and, you know, you, you do, as I say, I was never actually stalked, but you, there was behavior where you begin to think, actually, if you're not slightly careful, you know, you might find yourself in a position where you're being stalked. You spent um, a, a long time. I suppose the only reason I thought, mm. and, 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 and I suppose the only reason, the only reason I, I suppose I thought I'd mention it is because, that, you know, in the case of women, there's a lot of exposure of this sort of behaviour, mm. but I don't think it's only women who are on the receiving end of, of unwelcome, shall we say. Yeah. Uh, no, I, listen, I actually, I found it, it did resonate, because I've had a few stalkers. Uh, I, you know, I don't think men get taken as seriously with this kind of thing if they're on TV and stuff. It's not very nice. No. It's quite unsettling, actually. And I know female friends exactly. of mine, Emily Maitlis, our mutual friend, uh, Christine Bleakley, uh, now Lampard, They've had really serious mm -hmm. problems with stalkers because of their television yeah. personas, and it is it's very unsettling when it, when it happens to you. Um, Robert, do you like being famous? You were, you were a very acclaimed, a well-known financial journalist for a long period of time, but you weren't a telly star. Do you, do you like being the guy that everyone knows for his strange way of talking, his dynamic style? His, his own Twitter his, account his called Robert star, Pattinson's hair. His movie star looks. You have your own Twitter account for about your hair, for goodness sake. Uh, look, I, I, I'd been a print journalist for well over 20 years, and I was just looking for a, a new... Uh, challenge uh, and, and, and when it was, do you remember old Jeff Randall, who was business editor yeah. of the uh, BBC? Uh, when he stood down, an opening came there. I talked to BBC and I thought actually this would be uh, 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 an exciting new challenge. And I mean, my wife at the time, Sean Busby, did say to me, uh, you know, be aware, you know, your life will change. People will, in a way, think that they own you, and that 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 brings. Pressures, but actually, I've had no regrets. I mean, look, I've been an incredibly uh, fortunate journalist uh, because, I mean, you know. When I became business editor of the BBC, we had the financial crash. Uh, that sort of was the most amazing thing to be. Bad for Britain, great for Robert Peston. Uh, you know, um, you know, moved to ITV as political editor. You might say we've had the pol a political crash again. Maybe bad for Britain, certainly brilliant for me. So I've got no regrets. So our misery is your joy, is the bottom line, isn't it? You said it, Piers. <laughs>